Good morning, everyone. Stand with us, please. It's good to see you here this morning. Sing the song with me. Now I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my
turn around and find four or five people and find out why they're so grumpy this morning. But everybody's looking at me like somebody's kicked your dog on the way here or your, your wife busted at you. Let's find four or five people, go around the room, hug their neck, give them a high five, shake their hand, whatever. Let's put a smile on our face this morning, church. Come on. Y'all still grumpy? Y'all still, I mean, I got a bunch of people looking at me all mean, and you refuse to talk to the people in the church. So if you're in the front of the room, I want you to walk all the way to the back. And if you're in the back of the room, I want you to walk all the way to the front. And if you come across anybody on the way, why don't you smile at them and shake their hand or hug them or something? I mean, nobody, nobody made you dwell. Somebody might have made you come. Your kids, your parents might have made you come. Come on, let's listen.
Lord, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for your work on the cross, your sacrifice that you've provided to give us hope, to give us a way, to give us a future, to give us salvation in the name of Jesus and through the blood of Jesus. By the power of your love, Lord God, we just pray this morning, Lord God, that it all would experience that love, that all would come to know you in this place, Lord.
Aren't you glad for the hope that Jesus provides? Man, it's not hope in me or hope in you or hope in Brother Gerald, but the hope of Jesus. So that's, that's amazing. So I'm so happy for that. Well, good morning. My name is Jerry. I'm glad to see you here this morning. I want to say welcome. I hope someone has made you feel welcome. If not, I want to say welcome to you this morning. So glad you're here. I only have one announcement really today, or one and a half announcements. Number one is that, you know, we started small groups back last month. And small groups, so the plan was to, st to have small groups once a month, the first Sunday of the month. But this coming month uh, for September, we're not going to do that. We're going to bump it back a one week. So you guys all familiar with the date, September the 11th. So September the 11th is when we're going to have our next small group. So uh, we're not going to have it the first week because of Labor Day. So everybody understand Labor Day is going to mess everything up. People won't be here. They'll be traveling. So we're not going to have small groups the first week, in a couple of weeks from now, we're going to bump it back uh, one week to September the 11th because of the Labor Day holiday the, the week before. So go ahead and put that on your calendars. Be prepared to, to if you, by the way, if you haven't gone to a small group, we want you to, you can, it's not too late. You can join one. If you went to one last, uh, a few weeks ago and you didn't like it, you can change, right? So no big deal. So uh, we want you to, to find one you like and get involved. So, all right. So uh, really... No announcements today except for Brother Gerald's going to come up here a little early. We're having deacon elections today. We announced that last week, so we're going to elect. Uh, I'll let Brother Gerald give all the details, but we want to, the, ba the ballot's going to have three people on it. We really want you to only vote for two people. Two people. You don't have to vote for two people. You don't even have to vote, but you have to vote for, if you're going to vote, you cannot vote for more than two. There's three on the ballot, so please don't circle all three. Your ballot will be thrown out. So, Brother Joe, you going to come up and run the deacon election? Oh, yes. This is a wonderful time. Everybody's been looking forward to, right? No, no, no. But it's something that's necessary. Uh, our deacons will be handing out uh, ballots. If you are a member of this church, we want you to vote. And uh, this is deacons that will start uh, the 1st of September. All right. Now, as Jerry's already said, you you circle two, and the ones, the two that gets the most votes will be our two deacons. I believe that's right. And then, well, there's there's a there's there's a little bit of uh, we may have to have two two ballots, but uh, then the 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 other one will be the alternate. So you vote, but do not vote often. Just vote one time. All right, got ballot up here that's needed up, up upstairs. Two ballots, two ballots. Okay. All right. Now, when you get those circled, uh, fold your ballot and pass it to the center aisle, and the deacons will come back by and get your ballot. Well, the, the, pass them to the aisle. You know. As long as it gets to the aisle, it'll be all right. I think I confused BJ. Okay. All right. All right. Are we, are we, are we getting them passed in? All right, now let me say a word of thanks. Thank you for allowing me to go on vacation last week and uh, had, a, had a wonderful time. I'm, I'm sure that, 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 that uh, Tony Cooper did a great job in preaching last Sunday. He's a wonderful friend and been that way for a long time, but a great preacher. We just appreciate him. And last Sunday... <clears throat> I was not here, but we went to a church in Asheville, North Carolina called uh, New Life Community Church. Man, that was great, and I needed feeding, and the pastor fed me, and it was a great service, and we just enjoyed it so much. We saw such great sights, and uh, don't have time to tell you all about that, but thank you for letting me go 
during this time. I want you to turn in your Bible to John, the fourth chapter, and we're going to read uh, beginning in verse 10 down through verse 26. And uh, this is still in our series, Life in the Spirit. <clears throat> John chapter 4, verse 10 through 26. And, and you're going to say, this is such a familiar passage. You've, you've referred to it many times, Brother Gerald. I know that, but I, the Lord led me to this. Uh, somebody said, how long, Brother Gerald, are you going to keep on preaching on life in the Spirit? Well, until the Lord says, don't do it no more because he is telling me each week what to preach on and, and what text to take. So John chapter 4, <clears throat> beginning in verse 10, when you get that opening, stand up with me, please. And we're going to read John, 10, John 4, verse 10 through verse 26. If you're ready, say ready. ready. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now hast is not thy husband, in that saidst thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet, you think? Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And we'll stop reading right there. And all people said, Amen. 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 Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity today to look into your word. How pure, how wonderful, how sweet it is, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for you revealing truth to us. Help us today, Lord God to understand what worship is all about. Help us to understand, Lord God, that, that we can be closer to you in worship than at any other time. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our lives. Help us now, Father, to apply this to our lives individually, not corporately, not even uh, to our neighbor, but to us. Help us to apply it to ourselves. We love you and we praise you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We, we want to talk about life in the Spirit. We're going to continue on with that. The, the second week that we preached on this series, we preached on life in the fullness, talking about being filled with the Spirit. The third week, we talked about life in the overflow, the operating out of the overflow of the Spirit of God out of you. Then the fourth week we talked about the gifted life. We talked about gifts of the Spirit. The fifth week we talked about life in the temple. Uh, we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And together we are built together for an habitation of God in the Spirit. We together are the temple of God. Verse uh, number six, the sixth week we talked about the fruitful life the fruit of the Spirit. 
And then the seventh week we talked about the life of power. Jesus said, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. And then the eighth week, which was the last time we met and under this subject, we talked to you about the guided life being led by the Spirit. Now this morning, I want to talk to you about the life of worship. The life of worship. Jesus talked about worship. God is vitally interested in worship. You can be closer to God in worship than at any other time. I want you to understand what worship is. Jesus wanted us to understand what it was all about. Let me give you today's big idea before we preach, and you'll understand where we're going with this. Many people today mistake singing, praying, praising, or even preaching for worship because we do that in a worship service. However, worship is something entirely different. Worship is something that is vital to our Lord and to us as believers. Today we will explore what worship really is and discover how true worship can bring you to God in a more meaningful and personal way. Worship is something that God is very, very interested in. As a matter of fact, he, he, He's wanting you to worship a lot more than you want to worship. And by the way, you're worshiping as much right now as you want to. You want to worship more, you can. But God's interested in worship. He's, he's interested in how we worship and what we worship. The first mention of worship is in Genesis chapter 22, verse 5, and it's Abraham. Can you believe that there's no, before Abraham, there was no mention of worship? And it says there in, in Genesis 22, 5, And Abraham said unto his young men, this is when he was going up to sacrifice Isaac, remember? He said to his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. My question is, what is worship? What is worship in its basic terms? Uh, it's mentioned 198 times in the Bible. And uh, of those 198 times, there's a sp specific thing said about it, uh, at least 50 of those times. But God's talking about worship all through the Word of God. What is worship? Well, it, it, it literally means to bow or prostrate oneself before someone or something. It, it, basically, it just means to bow down, to fall on your face before someone. And, you know, sometimes I wonder, do we really know what worship is? We come to a worship service, but is anybody falling down? <laughs> is anybody bowing down? And, you know, that's what worship is. And in, in the... In the Old Testament Hebrew, it's the word uh, shaha. And that means literally to bow down or to fall down. Listen in Genesis chapter 24, verse 50 and 52. Matter of fact, turn there if you would. Genesis chapter 24, 50 and 52. I'm not going to carry you to all the verses that talk about worship, but I want to I point out a few that will help you to understand what worship is really is all about. Genesis chapter 24, verse 50 through 52. Now this is at the time when, when Abraham had sent his servant uh, to go get a, 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 a wife for his son Jacob. Verse 50, Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go and let her be thy master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard these words, he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. 
bowing himself to the earth. He worshiped the Lord. How did he do that? He bowed himself to the earth. Now, you know, Old Testament, I can give you verse after verse many, many times, at least 30 times in the Old Testament, it talks about worship and it says that they bowed down or they put their faces to the ground. That's what worship means. That in, in the Hebrew, that's the meaning of that word that's translated worship. It's translated fall down. Sometimes it's translated bow. But it's always that meaning, worship. And we call what we do worship service. Do we worship? Absolutely. We're going to get into that. But most of what we do is praise. Most of what we do is, is, is service to the Lord. We give, and that, can, that is considered a worship. But it literally means to bow down. It means to bow or prostrate oneself before someone or something. Then you go over the book of the Revelation in the New Testament. Turn over there, if you would. And, and we see in Revelation chapter 4, verse 8 through 11, I'm going to turn you to a lot of places because I want your faith to be in God's word, not in Brother Gerald's word. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8 through 11. When you get that, say, got it. Here's the scene there in heaven. You think that they're worshiping in heaven? Absolutely they are. You think they know how to do it? Yes, they do. Look at, look at verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Somebody said, they're worshiping. right? No, they're not worshiping. They're praising. Verse 9. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Worship, taken in the English language, that word that we say worship, it's taken from the Old English worthship. Worthship. And you see, they're saying, worthy, worthy, worthy. They're praising, saying worthy, but they are ascribing worth to the Lord. Worthy is the Lamb, is what they say in heaven. But they're praising. You see, these four and twenty elders, they fall down a lot. They fall down and they worship over and over. And then look at chapter 5. Verse 14. Revelation 5, 14. And the four beasts said, Amen. What, what were they saying amen to? All the creatures in heaven and in earth were saying, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. And all these beasts say, <coughs> Amen. It's the first time they stop saying, Holy, Holy, Holy. They say, Amen. And look what it says. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And then Revelation chapter 7. Now, angels worship also. Do you think that they know how to worship? I said, do you think they know how to worship? Absolutely, Absolutely they do. They do the Father's bidding. And the Father's bidding was to worship. Look at Chapter 7 of Revelation, verse 11. And all the angels, all of them, all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell down before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. So what is worship? In the Old Testament and the book of the Revelation, it's falling down. But what about the New Testament? The New Testament Greek word is proskuneo in the Greek, 
It's the word that Jesus used when he said, uh, you, you got to worship in spirit and in truth. It's the word that he used. So what is the meaning of that word? The meaning of that word in the New Testament Greek is this, and it can only mean this, according to the translators, to prostrate oneself in homage. Fall out in homage before the Lord. It, it, also, it means to humbly and without conditions show allegiance and dependence. I'm asking, do we worship? Do we ever worship physically like that? Do we worship? You know, I remember a time when there were some guys that would come by my office that on a regular basis when I was at another church and, and we would do what, what we call carpet diving. And what was carpet diving? We'd get on our face before the Lord. And I tell you what, that was a, a wonderful thing. But let me tell you something. What was really more wonderful than that was when my heart actually got down there. We had to lay there a while before I got there. And the other guys testified the same thing. When my heart finally got in homage before the Lord and in obeisance to God, when my heart finally got there, oh, how wonderful it was. And how close you are to the Lord God Almighty in worship. Now, even the devil knew what worship was. Look at Matthew chapter 4. Turn there if you would. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. This is when Jesus was tempted of the devil out there in the wilderness. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Are you there? Say amen. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The devil knew what worship was all about. If you'll just fall down now and worship me, You'll do homage to me, the devil said. I'll give you those kingdoms, the kingdoms, the kingdoms. You know, that's, that's a, an amazing thing that the devil knows what worship is, and sometimes we don't know what it is. But Jesus is talking about worship. And you'll remember what happened there with the woman at the well. Jesus, Jesus asked her for some water. And Jesus wanted to drink water, and he said to her, if you knew who it was that speaks to you, you would ask of him, and he would give you living water. Now we know from what Jesus said in John 7, 37, that living water is the Holy Ghost. How do you know that, Brother Gerald? In the, the last day of the feast, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried with a loud voice, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, for they that believe on him should receive, because Jesus was not yet glorified. He spoke of the Spirit, living water. Jesus, Jesus said, if you knew who it was talking to you, you would ask Him and He would give you living water. She said, hey, give me that water that I don't thirst again and, and, and I don't have to come here and draw. Jesus said, go call your husband. Bring him here and I'll give you all that living water. She said, well, I don't have a husband. He said, you're right, you don't have a husband. You've had five. And the one you're now with is not your husband. So you said the truth that you don't have a husband. And she wanted to change the subject. I'm glad she did. She said, she said our fathers worshipped in this mountain. But you say 
that it's in Jerusalem that a man ought to worship. And Jesus said, The hour is coming when neither in Jerusalem nor in this mountain you shall worship. He said, You don't even know what you worship. But we know what we worship because salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship God in spirit and in truth. Why? For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and and in truth. And then she changes the subject again, and she says, I know that Messiah is coming, which is called the Christ, and when He comes, He'll tell us all things. He'll tell us about worship. He'll tell us where we need to worship. And Jesus said, you're looking at Him, the one you're speaking to now. I'm He. Ooh. Did Jesus know what real worship was? Did Jesus know what true worship is? Genuine worship. Well, I want to give it to you in the negative first, what true worship is not according to Jesus. What true worship is not according to Jesus. Well, number one, true worship is not something done at a designated place. Hello? Jesus said, true worship, not in Jerusalem or in that mountain. It's not done in a designated place. Now, I've had people tell me, you can't can't worship up there at that church because we're the only ones that worship. Okay? you got to be in our church building to worship. But listen, listen to me. You don't have to be in any church building to worship. You don't have to be in this one or that one or the one in North Carolina or wherever you are. You don't have to be in the largest church in the world to worship God. As a matter of fact, you may not be able to in some of those churches. Why, Brother Gerald? Because that's not true worship. True worship is not something that you do physically. Jesus said, I believe true worship is not something done at a designated place. Verse 21 and 22, back at John chapter 4. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Hmm. It's not something that's done at a designated place. I'm talking about true worship, real worship, genuine worship. That's what Jesus is talking about. Number two, true worship is not done in a specific way. It's not something that's done in a specific way. Verse 22, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now, let me tell you about this woman. Let me tell you about the Samaritans. They were idolaters, even though they said they worshiped the true true God. They worshiped up in the mountains. They worshiped on every high hill. And we've been studying on, on Wednesday about the idolatry that was carried on in Israel. And... They worshiped on every high hill, in every grove. But she said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain. Now, listen, they thought that they were worshiping the true God. But Jesus said, you don't know what you worship. You see, idolatry is this. They say, this is the true God. As a matter of fact, the the Israelites that were idolaters and and worshiping the, the calves and worshiping all these idols that were up on the high hills and in the mountains, they were saying, they were saying, this is Jehovah, this is Yahweh. But he wasn't. Amen? 
Now, I can understand worshiping on a, a high mountain. We went down the, the Blue Ridge Parkway, down the, up the Blue Ridge Parkway through North Carolina and, and into Virginia. And I'm telling you, we, we saw some sights that was unbelievable. There at a place called Little Switzerland, I tell you, I was just ready to fall on my face and worship God. I understand worshiping in, on the high mountain. But Jesus said, there's a day's coming when you don't have to do that on a mountain. You don't have to do that in Jerusalem. You don't have to do that in Waterstone Church. You don't have to do that at church down the road. It's not a specific place. And it's not in a specific way. Somebody said, well, now, now Brother Gerald, you, you can't worship unless you lift in your hands. I beg your pardon. That's not biblical. That's praise. Lifting your hands, praise. That's not worship. What's worship? Falling down. It's, 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 it's not something that's done in a specific way. Somebody said, well, you can't worship unless you're speaking in tongues because he said you got to worship in spirit and truth. There's an application to that, but that's not the main application. Not what Jesus is talking about. Well, Brother Gerald, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't worship unless somebody gets up and has three points in a sermon. Mm. You don't even have to have a sermon to worship. Amen? Amen? Jesus is saying it's not in a specific way. Number three, Jesus is saying true worship. Now, by the way, Jesus used that term true worship. It's not me saying true worship. Verse 23, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers, he says. True worshipers. True worship, number three, true worship is not done in a, by a particular people. Not the Jews, not the Samaritans, not the Baptists, not the Methodists, not the independents, not the community churches. It doesn't have to be a specific thing. I ran across a, a group not, well, it's, it's been a, quite a few years ago now, but that group amazed me. They were worse than the group that I grew up with. I did a funeral with the pastor of that church, Brother Johnny, and, 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 and I said, all right, brother, how are we going to? He said, hold off, hold off right there. I'm not your brother. I said, well, I thought you were saved. He said, I am, but you're not because you belong to that church. I said, well, how's the worship... How's the service going to go in this funeral? How do you want it to go? He said, I'll tell you this, we don't want to worship because we can't worship with you because you are not of God. I was amazed. And I thought, well, isn't that something where Jesus says that it's not, true worship is not by particular people, not by Jews, not by the Samaritans, not by the Baptists or the Church of God or the Assembly of God, not by the Catholics or the Methodists. Hey, listen, listen to me. True worship and true worshipers are children of God. And Jesus said that time's coming, and it's now when true worshipers, true worship. And then, number four, true worship is not done in an outward show. You know, you can bow down, and you can kneel on this altar, and you can lay on this floor on your face and still not worship. It's not for show. And, you know, I, I, I've I run across people all the time that says, now, I can't worship in that church because nobody else is. Oh, wait a minute. You don't worship because other people are worshiping. 
is an individual thing. Corporate worship, listen, listen to me, corporate worship is, is not really found in the Word of God. We see, we see big groups worshiping sometimes, but that's not prescribed by the Lord God Almighty. Worship is an individual thing. Amen? Now, we've, we, we've, we found out what true worship is not. Let me, let's see what true worship is. What is true worship according to Jesus? What is true worship according to Jesus? Number one, true worship is something done in the spiritual realm instead of the flesh. He said you ought to worship in spirit. Why, Jesus, do we have to worship in spirit? For, because God's spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Why do I need to be in the spiritual realm? I, hey, I, I read the book of the Revelation, and one of the first things it says that John, I, John, was on the Isle of Patmos on the Lord's Day, and I was in the spirit. Hey, it's, it's got to be in the spiritual realm. You, by spirit, you come to the Lord. We're going to talk about this in a moment. You, you lay down before Him in your spirit and you give obeisance and homage to Him in the spirit. True worship is something done in the spiritual realm instead of the flesh. Verse 23, he said, the hour is coming. And by the way, lady, it's already here. The hour is coming and now is, he said, when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. But not only is something done in the spiritual realm, number two, true worship is something done in the truth rather than in speculation or falsehood. See, Jesus is, is going on what he's already said. He said, you don't know what you worship. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. You don't know what you worship. Listen, you have to know by the word of God and by the impartation of the spirit of God who God is. You can't know him otherwise. And that's true. The truth of God comes to you and you find out He is who He said He was. He's, he's the God of, of, of mercy and He's the God of grace. He's the God of long-suffering. He's the God that forgives. He's the God that heals. He's the God that reaches out to you and does for you what you need and what you can't do for yourself. And then, whew, suddenly you, you, you worship Him when you find that truth. You've got to worship in spirit and in truth, He says. But then number three, true worship <clears throat> is something in which the Father is so interested, He is seeking those to do it. Look at it. Look at it. Let's, 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 let's read it. Verse 21. Ver, excuse me. I'm sorry. Verse 23. But the hour cometh... And now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Why, Jesus? Why? For the Father, or because the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Do you know God's looking for someone that will worship Him in spirit and in truth? We know that that, 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 that the Father's looking for certain things in the Word of God. Three things I find where God's looking for something. He said to King Asa, He said, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward Him. 
He's looking for someone that their heart will be fixed on the Lord so that he can be strong for them. Another instance where Jesus is looking for someone, God's looking for someone, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. He's looking for those that are lost so he can save them. And then the third thing is right here. The Father's looking for someone to worship Him in spirit and in truth. He's so interested in it. He's looking for someone to do that. In heaven, there's no problem. Oh, they're, they're worshiping Him. They're falling down all over the place. I could show you so many scriptures in the book of the Revelation, the scene in heaven where they're falling down, where they're, they're bowing themselves in obeisance to the Lord. But he's looking for somebody here. Somebody on the is he is he looking for you? Look up here at me. Look up here. Is he looking for you? Has he found you to worship him in spirit and in truth? Now this idea of uh, of worship goes back a long time, but even in times fairly modern in medieval times there was something that was called the feudal homage and there's pictures of that painted I wish that I'd included that on the slides that you see up front of you but it was a time uh, when it was worship of a king Luke, come up here. I want to, I want to, I want to demonstrate this. Luke, <laughs> I, want you, I want you to sit right here on this, on this step. Luke's the king. <laughs> He's wanted me to say that for years. Hasn't he? <laughs> now, the feudal homage, many have said that it, it, this was like, this, this, was, this was where we get the idea of prayer of the folded hands in prayer. You know, that, that's not in the Bible where they put their hands together. But they, many have said that, you, that we get that idea of prayer with the folded hands from the feudal homage that was done in Middle, medieval times. And a king would sit on the throne. And by the way, uh, the feudal, feudalism was a, a, a type of government where a king owned everything and his subjects uh, would have the right to, to work the land and get protection from the king and, and his army. But they would come, the knights would come first and then the peasants would come later and they would do the, the feudal homage ceremony. The king would sit on his throne, <laughs> you like that, don't you, with his hands like this, okay? Do your hands like this. Now watch this. The peasants would come and would do homage to the king, crawl up to him and place their hands in his hands. And what this signified was, I'm giving you everything that I've got. I am, everything that I am and everything I ever will be, everything I ever hope for, it's in your hands, king. And the king then would take his hands and put them beside my hands. And he would say, you're mine. Saying that I will protect you. But I'm, I'm giving you homage, O oh King Luke. <laughs> this was feudal homage. Now that's, that's worship. And they called it worship in medieval times. 
worshiping the king. Now, let me tell you something. You can sit down, king. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. That's what true worship is all about. When I come with my heart and I come and bow before the Lord God Almighty, the ruler of heaven and earth, and I place my hands in his hands, and I say, all that I am, all that I ever have been, all that I ever will have, every hope, every dream, it's in you, O King. And I'm worshiping by doing that. That's true worship. And let me tell you something. God's looking for someone to do that. Has He found you? Are you the one that He's looking for? The Father seeketh such to worship Him. For God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. I want to be a true worshiper. And let me tell you something. When that happens, you're closer to God than you've ever been. The relationship with, between you and God is so genuine and so real. It's tangible. I can still remember the, the grip that God placed upon my heart during those times. And I want to be that worshiper. Well, how do I get there, Brother Gerald? How do I do that true worship? First of all, you've got to repent of all the idols that you were falling down before. Well, Brother Gerald, we don't have any idols. We don't, we don't have any, any graven images. Or, no, we don't have graven images, but we have some things whether it's the idol of, of money or the idol of family or the idol of fame, fortune, and God forbid that I should say this, the idol of football. <laughs> There's a warning God gives. And I want to read that. I want you to turn there. It's the last place I'll have you to turn. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And this is a warning that God gives concerning bowing down to idols. God is a jealous God. He said, I'll not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not bow down yourself to them, nor worship or serve them, he said, nor serve them. Bow down to worship. He said, you won't do that. But look in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 16. When you get that, say, got it. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Verse 17, you need to mark. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whether thou passeth over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Listen. I believe with all my heart, because God has not changed. I believe 
most of your problems, most of my problems can be traced right back to that very thing. Not worshiping the Lord. Let me tell you something. Man is made this way. You're going to worship something. You're going to put your hope on something. You're going to look forward to something. You're going to have your, your heart set on something. The question is, what is it? What is it? God's looking for someone to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the question is, is it you? Has He found you? Oh, I want to, I want to bow down. I want to put my face to the ground. And say, God, everything that I am, everything that I ever will have, everything that I, I have right now, every hope, every dream that I ever conceive in my mind, it's yours, Lord, because you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy to receive it. And he said, I found you. I found you. You're worshiping me right. Every head bowed, every eye closed. He looking for you? Has he found you? I want to confess to you right now there's been many things that I have given my heart to that I should not have. There's been many things that I bowed down to and worshipped that God wasn't pleased with. And most of my problems I can, that I've ever had, I can trace back to that, to leaving in my heart worship of the Lord. Maybe that's, that's your confession also. I need to repent of that. I need to repent of those things. I need to say, Lord God, you are my God, and I need to fall down before him. But there may be some of you here today that's not saved. You've never made Jesus Lord. you never made him king, even though he's Lord of all. But you've never bowed down. You've never said, Jesus, you're Lord. You're my Savior. You're my source. You can do that today. If you will just fall at his feet as those early disciples did when they knew that he was Messiah. You can just fall at his feet and worship today. And those of us who already are born again, Today is the day of repentance. Today is the day to turn. Today is the day to fall down and worship in your heart the Lord God Almighty. Father, I thank you for the opportunity today, Lord God, to come to you with a full heart, with an open heart, hating my sin of turning from you. Loving the worship that I have with you. Bowing without any, without any doubt, without any any circumstances our unknowns. Worshiping you forever. Help us now, Lord God, to do that. Help us to not have any, any pauses 
in our worship. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We love you and we praise you. We honor you in Jesus' name. We ask these things. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.